Today we have uh, Christina Williamson, who is coming to us from NOAA and Ceres, uh, where she her research focuses on in situ measurements of microphysical properties of atmospheric aerosol with a special focus on new particle formation and its influence on the pre-industrial atmosphere. Christina has an undergraduate master's in physics from Oxford University and completed her PhD at Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main. Her doctoral work focused on understanding aerosol formation in the highly controlled environment of the cloud chamber at CERN, where she studied how different precursor gases and charge states affect how fast particles can form and grow. At NOAA, she's been measuring aerosol microphysical properties on the NASA Atmospheric Tomography Mission. She's looking at how spatio-temporal variations of nano aerosol size distributions inform our understanding of the global importance of new particle formation in affecting cloud properties, and uses these measurements to constrain formation, processing, and transportation of aerosol in chemistry climate models. Today, she'll give us a global view on atmospheric new particle formation from the atmospheric tomography mission. Christina. Thank you. So yeah, today I'll be talking about measurements we've made of aerosol size distributions on the NASA Atmospheric Tomography Mission and what these are telling us about new particle formation in the remote atmosphere. And the reason we care about this is that aerosols are still one of the largest uncertainties we have in predicting climate. And this is really nicely illustrated by this figure from Ross Salovich's recent book, which is based on aerosol radiative forcings from Smith and Bond's 2014 paper. And what you can see here in that solid black line on the top is the total radiative forcing for a given scenario for greenhouse gases, with the uncertainty represented by that error bar in the middle. If you look below the zero line at all of the negative radiative forcings, those are all from aerosols, and the spread of those, current li those colored lines is the current uncertainty. You can see that it's huge when compared with the total uncertainty on greenhouse gases. And one of the reasons for this is, unlike for greenhouse gases, we have no past climate record of aerosols. And so all we can really do is measure and understand in the present day, and then go both backwards and forwards in our global models to get the radiative forcings. Now, aerosols uh, uh, exert a radiative forcing in two ways. Um, they can directly scatter sunlight if they're of sizes about 100 nanometers and above, or they can act as cloud condensation nuclei, the seas on which cloud droplets are formed. And so if you form a cloud and you only have a few CCN, cloud condensation nuclei, present, uh, your cloud's going to be relatively dull in appearance. It's going to be made up of just a few larger droplets, um, and it's going to precipitate out relatively fast. Whereas if you have a lot of aerosol that can act as cloud condensation nuclei present, uh, your cloud is going to be made up of lots of smaller droplets. It's going to be relatively bright in appearance. It's going to reflect a lot more sunlight. And it's also going to precipitate out a lot later. And so it'll have a greater impact on albedo just because it hangs around a bit longer. But aerosol can only really act as cloud condensation nuclei once they reach sizes about 60 nanometers and above. Now, today we're going to be focusing on new particle formation. Um, and just to sort of get us all at the same page on this, it's helpful to think about it in terms of energy space, and namely the Gibbs free energy. Um, so if we think about uh, an area of the atmosphere, you have a lot of molecules hanging around in the gas phase. And occasionally, a few of them will collide and make a small cluster. But when the cluster is really small, it's much more energetically favorable for them to re-evaporate back into the gas phase than to stay together as a cluster. However, if by random motion enough of these molecules cluster together, uh, you can reach a, a radius of the particle where it's actually more energetically favorable for them to stay together than for them to break apart again. And it's at this moment that we say the aerosol particle has nucleated, it's a stable particle, and it's now much more likely that it'll continue to grow than it'll re-evaporate into the gas phase. And it grows in two main ways. Firstly, condensation, so just by other gas phase molecules colliding with it and accreting onto the surface. The second is coagulation, whereby two particles form independently, uh, collide, and stick together and make one larger particle. Now, this whole process of forming and growing particles has a number of questions around it that we're trying to answer. 
We want to know which gas phase species are making the aerosols and where the different species are involved. So sulfuric acid is one of the major uh, species we know are involved in aerosol new particle formation. Um, sulfuric acid in water is like the simplest system for forming an aerosol particle. But we also know, for example, if ammonia is present, that's going to speed up the rate at which these particles are formed. It's essentially going to lower the height of this energy barrier that we see. Similarly, there could be other low volatility species involved, especially those that are coming off of organic compounds in the atmosphere. So we want to know how much these are involved in which regions of the atmosphere. And just as we're interested in how they're forming the particles, we also want to know which gas phase species are most involved in growing the particles. We're also interested in where in the atmosphere new particle formation is taking place because this is a really temperature dependent process. And so it happens a lot faster in cold regions of the atmosphere than it does in warm regions. And essentially, if it's colder, you're again going to lower the height of that energy barrier, make it easier to make your new particles. Um, but these particles form at sizes around one or two nanometers in diameter. And as I was saying earlier, the particles that we care about for radiative effects need to be 60 or 100 nanometers in diameter. So there's a hell of a lot of growth that has to go on between a particle being formed and it actually being important for climate. So you can imagine if a particle forms in a very dirty, polluted atmosphere and it's trying to grow, it's very likely that it's going to collide with another large particle that's hanging around um, and coagulate with it before it reaches 60 nanometers. And then it's essentially removed from the system. It's not adding anything much to the big particle um, and it can no longer have an effect of its own. Whereas if the same particle were formed in a really clean atmosphere with very few other particles hanging around, it's much more likely to survive long enough to grow to sizes where it can act as a cloud condensation nuclei or scatter sunlight. And for this reason, new particle formation may be a lot more important in the pre-industrial atmosphere than it is today. And this is really nicely illustrated by this figure from Hamish Gordon's 2016 paper. So what we did here was to take a new nucleation mechanism, namely nucleation without sulfuric acid, so just involving organic vapors, and we popped it into a global chemistry climate model that already included a pretty comprehensive representation of new particle formation. And we looked at the difference this made, not to the number of small particles, but the to the number of cloud condensation nuclei present. On the right, you can see in the present day, it does make a difference to the number of CCN. But if you look on the left in the pre-industrial, you can see that that difference is way larger and way more global in scale. And this is why we care about new particle formation so much. If we're going backwards in our models to get that radiative forcing, we want to get the new particle formation component of it correct. So we're asking two questions. Firstly, what is it that's controlling new particle formation in the present day atmosphere? And secondly, how does our knowledge of this affect aerosols in the pre-industrial atmosphere? And to really get from the first to the second question, we have to ask how well can we represent what we're seeing today in global climate models? So to answer these questions, we are measuring aerosol size distributions on the NASA Atmospheric Tomography mission. And what I'm showing here are the flight paths of the mission for the first three deployments. We're actually doing four deployments of ATOM once in each of the four seasons, with the next one coming up, well, starting next week, actually. Um, and as you can see, we're flying over remote marine regions of the atmosphere. We're covering both Pacific and Atlantic ocean basins and going pretty much pole to pole. We're not just flying a straight route, as this map might suggest, but actually constantly scanning the vertical structure of the atmosphere from about 0.2 kilometers up to 13 kilometers in altitude. So really getting from the marine boundary layer up to when we're over the poles, up to the stratosphere, or at least up to the, tro the free troposphere. So this is the route that we flew in the first ATOM deployment, and you can see all of our ups and downs scanning as we fly. Now, ATOM's a relatively large mission. We're flying on the NASA DC-8, which can hold about 23 instrument teams or roughly 30 scientists at any one time. This is a picture of all of us arriving in Hawaii on the most recent deployment. Um, and it's not an aerosol-focused mission. It's actually got two main foci, which are uh, long-lived climate forces and then atmospheric reactivity. But we do have a substantial aerosol payload. We have measurements of composition in both single particle and bulk black carbon and cloud properties. And then the group that I'm with, we're measuring aerosol size distributions. Um, and this is mainly being done by three of us. There's Charles Brock at NOAA, Agnieszka Cook, who was with us at NOAA for the last two years and has just gone back to the University of Vienna, and myself.
Um, and so for anyone who's not particularly familiar with aerosol size distributions, I've just drawn a cartoon of a typical atmospheric distribution here on the left. And what I want you to notice is the log scale on the x-axis. Because we're having to measure over so many orders of magnitude to capture the aerosol size distribution, we need a whole suite of instrumentation to do this. Um, so we start off at the large sizes, at tens or hundreds of microns, with cloud probes out on the wing, which are being operated by our colleagues from the University of Vienna. Then below that, we have optical particle counters, which work by scattering a laser off the aerosol present in the sample, um, and then getting the size and the number of the particles uh, from me scattering. And below that, we have two custom-built instruments called nucleation mode aerosol size spectrometers. Uh, we've published the details of this instrumentation in two papers this year in AMT. Uh, but I'm going to go on now and just talk briefly about the nucleation mode aerosol size spectrometer, as we actually need to have a little knowledge of how this works in order to interpret the ATOM data. <clears throat> So it's based on the principle of a condensation particle counter. And what this does is it brings in a, a, a sample stream which may contain aerosol and mixes it in a hot region of the instrument uh, with a working fluid. You then cool down the mixture rapidly in the condenser, and the working fluid becomes supersaturated so that it condenses onto any particles that are present in the sample. This grows them, and then you can then just scatter a laser off them and work out from the interference in that laser how many particles are present in the first place. And when you do this, uh, you can start counting particles above a given size. Uh, and the instrument refun response function as a size of diameter could be, is shown here. And then if you change that supersaturation you create in the instrument, you can actually change the size at which you start measuring particles. So for instance, if you made your supersaturation less, if you have less of a temperature difference in your instrument, you can start counting larger particles like we're showing here. And that's basically how the NMAS works. We have five of these condensation ca particle counters uh, as a battery, and then we just set them all counting particles above different given sizes. And you can see from the difference between those channels, or well, in fact, we do an inversion, um, you can get out a full size distribution between about three and 60 nanometers. And then, because we're really interested in the details of exactly when new particles are taking place, how quickly the particles are growing, we operate two of these instruments, giving us 10 channels and better size resolution. So that's a little bit about why we're flying and what we're flying. Um, and I'll now go on to talk about what we're seeing on the ATOM mission. And all of the results I'm presenting today are coming from the first ATOM deployment, which took place in Northern Hemisphere summer 2016. So what I'm showing here are curtain plots um, to illustrate the data that we're seeing. So I've got on the x-axis the latitude, and I've just sine weighted that to better represent the volume of the atmosphere that we're seeing. And then the y-axis uh, is the altitude represented by pressure. And the colored lines there are the flight tracks that we took on ATOM on the first ATOM deployment. The colors of these tracks represent the number concentration of particles between 3 and 60 nanometers. So these are particles that are likely to have come from this new particle formation process. And their presence shows us a bit about where new particle formation is taking place in the atmosphere. And what we can notice is that high up in the tropical upper troposphere, we're seeing really high concentrations of these small particles. Now we can compare that to the total surface area of larger particles, of particles larger than about 60 nanometers. Um, and these are particles that have been in the atmosphere a pretty long time. Now they may have originally come from new particle formation, or they may well have been swept up from the surface, things like sea spray, desert dust, etc. And the reason I'm showing you the surface area here and not the number concentration is we're thinking about that process I was talking about before, whereas if you have a small particle forming and it needs to grow, it may well coagulate with a big particle and get removed from the system. So our surface area is linking us in with that thread of being removed for the small particles. And what you can see is high up in the tropical upper troposphere again, we're seeing low surface areas of these larger particles, not very many of them present at all. And we can start to look at the differences between the two ocean basins. So my colleague Agnieszka Cook has looked at uh, the average uh, number concentration of those small particles as a function of altitude just for the tropical region over both ocean basins. And you can see the Pacific Ocean in the black above about eight kilometers is showing us significantly more particles than the Atlantic Ocean in the red. I should say we're showing the mean 25th and 75th percentiles here with all of the data in the background. <clears throat> 
And if we switch over and look at that surface area of the larger particles, we can see the opposite effect. The Pacific Ocean is showing us a lower surface area high up uh, for those larger particles, and the Atlantic is showing us a higher surface area. And we can start to think about why this is. So Agnieszka has been looking with Eric Ray, our colleague at NOAA, at back trajectories in the Aton flights. So what we do is for every uh, bit of data that we're taking in the Aton flights, we say, okay, for this air mass, where has it been for the last 10 days? And we trace that back. And so what I'm showing here is our main flight for Aton 1 over the Atlantic. We're flying from Ascension Island up to the Azores, and that's that solid black line. And then I'm taking just the high altitude portions of those flights. So anything higher than about 400 millibar, because that's where we're seeing new particle formation. That's what we're interested in right now. Um, and I've plotted out the back trajectories from any portion of the flights that's at the high altitude. And the color of those back trajectories, so those, those are the colored lines on the plot, is representing the altitude not at which we're measuring, but at which the air parcel was for the 10 days before we measured it. And what you can see in the Atlantic is we have a lot of continental influence coming from Africa, from South America, from North America. And some of those back trajectories are getting down pretty low. So you can see how it's possible they might be bringing quite a lot of particles with them and increasing that surface area. If we look for contrast at the Pacific, so this is the same thing, the Pacific flight track from, uh, from Hawaii down to American Samoa in black, and there's back trajectories just for the high altitude portion of the flight and the colors, really different pictures. Most of that air has just been swirling around the Pacific for 10 days before we measured it. Um, and so not many sources of aerosols there. And also we know we're in a tropical region, a lot of deep convection. It's easy to see how we might not have many particles left by the time we're measuring them. And looking at this relationship between that surface area of large particles and the number concentration of the newly formed particles, we can start to see a relationship. So I'm just showing the Pacific data here for clarity. In the gray in the background, I'm showing all of the Pacific, a bit of an amorphous blob, no real relationship going on there. But in the colors, I'm highlighting the tropical free troposphere. And you start to see a relationship come out whereby a lower surface area is coincident with higher number concentrations of those newly formed particles. I've colored the data there uh, according to temperature because I said, as I said at the beginning, temperature is really important. If it's colder, it's just easier to make new particles. And you can see a little bit that the temperature variation there is starting to explain a little bit of the spread of that data. So is that it? Can we just explain where new particle formation is taking place by the absence of a sink, by the absence of large particles to impede it? Well, to answer that question, we actually have to look in a bit more sort of thermodynamic detail. And we, we want to calculate what we call a coagulation sink. Now, a coagulation sink is the threat or the rate of loss of a particle of a given size to any other particle that's present. And so we need to take into account all of the particles, their size, so the surface area they're presenting to the small particle, and also how quickly they're moving around in a given region of the atmosphere. So I've calculated this for Aton 1 as a sink, so the threat to any particle of 1.7 nanometers in size. 1.7 nanometers just being the typically taken diameter at which particles form in the atmosphere. So if something is just nucleated, just become a stable particle, this is the threat to survival that it's going to see. And if we look at the tropical upper troposphere again, we do see lower uh, coagulation sinks, the sort of bluer colors, um, but it's definitely not quite as, as distinct a picture as when we were looking at the surface area of the large particles. And indeed, when we try and recreate that relationship we saw, uh, where we had uh, low number concentration, sorry, high number concentrations of small particles, uh, coincident with high surf uh, low surface areas, we actually don't see it much when we look at the coagulation sink. Um, I've highlighted again the tropics and the colors, and really we're not seeing any relationship there at all. And we can start to understand why this is if we look at the relationship between the surface area and the coagulation sink. Um, so this is falling on pretty much a nice linear relationship for the majority of the data. But you can see that lump of data coming out the bottom there, where you've got a much higher coagulation sink than you might expect for a given surface area of large particles. And I've colored that by the altitude, by the pressure. And you can see that most of those points are at high altitudes. <clears throat> so we can look into this a bit further and look at where our coagulation sink, where that threat to particles surviving is really coming from. So what I'm plotting here is two of the profiles we made on our main Pacific flight over the tropics. And so that's shown the altitude of the plane is shown in those solid black lines uh, with the altitude given on the right-hand axis there. 
Then we've got the diameter on the left-hand axis, and the colors are representing the sink coming from each of the particle size bins shown here. And so we can start to look at where the coagulation sink is coming from. If we look in the marine boundary layer, these really low portions of the flight, we can see that most of that coagulation sink, the more red colors, are coming from particles that are 100 or so nanometers in diameter. These could well be things like sea spray coming up or larger aerosols in general. Then if we start to look higher, so getting into the free troposphere, um, but sticking below about eight kilometers, we see that the majority of the coagulation sink is coming from particles 60, 80 nanometers in diameter. So we were taking these into account really well when we looked at our surface area of the larger particles. However, what's interesting is that once we go above this, we see that actually a lot of the coagulation sink is coming from the small particles. That maximum there is 20, 30 nanometers in diameter. And even once you get down to the smallest particles, just a few nanometers in diameter, they have a substantial contribution to the coagulation sink here. <clears throat> so what's going on? We think it's again related to this uh, tropical atmospheric dynamics where you have, whereby you have deep convective clouds. So you can imagine if you're in the tropics, you're lofting that air from the marine boundary layer that mostly contains large particles up through your cloud. But the cloud acts as a filtration system for particles. Because these particles are big, they can activate, they can become cloud droplets, and they essentially get removed from your air mass. So by the time you get to the top of your cloud, there's not many of them left at all. That's why we were seeing those low surface areas Areas, that's why they're not contributing to our sink here. And we can see where this deep convection is taking place. So I've used, again, the back trajectories from Eric Ray. And I've said, OK, for every data point that we have on ATOM, what's the probability that the, the, the air that we're measuring at that point passed through a deep convective cloud? If there's zero probability, it's blue. If everything passed through a deep convective cloud, it's dark red. And you can see from the color distribution here that all of that deep convection uh, is influencing the air that we've been measuring in the tropics. And we can relate that directly to our surface areas. So here what I'm plotting is just for the tropical upper troposphere in the dark colors and for everything in the background in the lighter colors, uh, the surface area of those larger particles uh, against the depth of conductive cloud that the air parcel has passed through. And you can see that the deeper the cloud you pass through, the less surface area that is left. It's kind of giving us this idea that the longer you're in that cloud, the more large particles are getting removed. The Pacific is in the red, the Atlantic's in the blue, and we do see a different trend for both of those. But that makes sense because as we saw before, we have very different sources of aerosols in, over the Pacific and over the Atlantic. So even if we're removing them, we would expect the final number to be rather different. <clears throat> so you're going up through the deep convective cloud, you're removing a lot of your large particles, and then you're detraining air at the top of this cloud into very cold regions of the atmosphere. Uh, and because it's a deep convective cloud in the tropics, there's a really fast rate of going from the bottom of the cloud to the top of the cloud. So we do expect gas-based species that may be the precursors to a lot of the low volatility species that make the aerosols through the, nu uh, through the nucleation process, we expect, we expect those to get all the way through the cloud and make it up to the top. So therefore, when you're detraining your particle-free air in this really cold region of the atmosphere, it's kind of an ideal place for new particle formation to take place. And that's what we're seeing. Um, so what I'm showing here is the number concentration of really small particles, just 3 to 12 nanometers in diameter, against the time since the air mass was lost in a deep convective cloud. And what you can see, if we highlight the tropical upper troposphere again, that's the red points, um, there is a relationship whereby if the air mass was more recently in a deep convective cloud, there are more of these particles at small sizes. Now to really get into the details of where new particles has most recently taken place in the, in the atmosphere, we actually have to go back and look at that instrument again. And so the instrument, as I said at the beginning, is working by giving us number concentrations above a given diameter. So for example, the first channel say everything above three nanometers, and the second channel, everything above about seven nanometers. And we want to know where the most recent new particle formation has taken place. Uh, and that is, that will be shown up by particles that appear in the first channel, but not in the second. And we want to know where that's statistically significant. So what I'm showing here in the bottom in the two colored lines are the concentrations measured in those two channels. And you can see places where the first channel, that is the red one, is seeing more particles than the blue one, which might be indicative of new particle formation. But we want to know if that's statistically significant or not, uh, or whether it's just due to random fluctuations in both the atmosphere and the instrument. 
Um, and so a team from the uh, University of Denver and NCAR have worked on uh, a method that they're calling relative difference for determining where it's statistically significant. And so what we do is we take the difference between those channels and we express it as a function of uh, the standard deviation of the difference between the channels. And then we say if it's greater, if the difference is greater than three standard deviations, that's statistically significant. New particle formation, the concentration that we're seeing, uh, that's, uh, the larger concentration that we're seeing in the first channel uh, is not just due to random fluctuations, it's, it's actually a real phenomenon that we're seeing in the atmosphere. And so I've drawn that dotted line here at three sigma. Everything in the black line, that's the relative difference relating to the right-hand axis, um, is significant new particle formation. And we can go on and relate this to our ATOM data. So I've gridded out the area of the atmosphere that we pass through on ATOM. And then for each the grid box in terms of latitude and altitude, I count how many of the data points show statistically significant new particle formation. And so if every data point in a grid box shows new particle formation, it's going to be deep red. If none of them do, it's deep blue. And what we can see is this pattern, especially over the Pacific, where indeed all of that recent new particle formation is taking place high up in the tropical upper troposphere. There's also a lot of new particle formation going on over the Southern Ocean, and you can see that in the Atlantic as well. Uh, it's something we don't have time to get into today, but is definitely fascinating. Uh, over the Atlantic, it's really not such a strong pattern up in the tropical upper troposphere, but there's certainly signals of it go going on there. And again, we can relate that back to uh, the convective influence that we were looking at before. So what I'm showing here is the temperature and convective influence for all of the eight on one data in the background in gray. And then in the blue crosses, I've highlighted points to show statistically significant new particle formation. And then the yellow crosses on top of that, I'm just highlighting points that are in the tropics. And what you see is this general trend where new particle formation is coincident with, high, coincident with pro, higher probabilities of convective influence. And that is especially true for the tropics. And you also see that it's generally happening where we have those lower temperatures going on as well. <clears throat> Um, so now we're seeing that we've got this new particle formation, we've linked it to convective influence, um, but we have to ask ourselves, what's the fate of these particles? After all, they're forming at these really small sizes. We know that at that size, they're not relevant for climate. Um, so why do we care about them at all? Uh, this, this is the reason. So this is an average size distribution uh, over a 10 degree latitude that we band that we measured uh, over the tropical Pacific in ATOM-1. Uh, so I've got the diameter of the particles on the x-axis, I've got the altitude on the y-axis, and the colors represent the number concentration of particles in each of those size bins. Now there are two things we need to understand in order to be able to interpret this graph. Firstly, we don't measure aerosols when we're flying through a cloud. Well, we do measure them, but we get all sorts of artifacts in the data and we throw that data away, which means all of this data here is clear sky data. And we know that we're in the tropics, and if you're in the tropics and you're not in a deep convective cloud going up, you're generally coming down. So we've got descending motion here. The second thing we need to know is that we're not taking Lagrangian measurements on ATOM, meaning we're not following a specific air mass around. So I'm not going to try and pretend that the particles we see at the top here are the same as the particles we saw at the bottom there. That's definitely not the case. But look at this size distribution. It's really continuous. There's no big discontinuities coming in anywhere. And if we were seeing really different air masses with really different histories, really different particle sources, we would expect to see discontinuities. So what I think is going on here is we actually have a large regional phenomenon that's happening over large time scales, and that allows us to relate what's happening on this big picture scale to what may be happening to individual particles within the region. And if we take that, then we can see that what's happening is particles are forming at small sizes high up, coming in at those smaller size bins, and then growing fairly continuously as they descend. By the time they reach the marine boundary layer, what I'm going to do is pop a line there at 60 nanometers. Remember, that was our cutoff for forming cloud condensation nuclei. You can see that a lot of those particles have grown above 60 nanometers. They can start acting as cloud condensation nuclei. They can potentially have an influence on the global radiative balance. <clears throat> and so popping that into our cartoon, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing new particle formation at the top as you come out of the deep convective cloud, growth as the particles descend through that cloud-free air. And by the time they reach the marine boundary layer, a lot of them can act as cloud condensation nuclei. They can start affecting the radiative properties of clouds that are forming there and potentially having an impact on climate, which we need to know about and we need to include in our global climate models. <clears throat> 
So the next question to answer then is, do we capture what we're seeing on ATOM in our models? And the second question is, can the models actually inform us anything about what's taking place in this new particle formation? So because ATOM is not a specifically aerosol-focused mission, we're actually not measuring a lot of the species we would like to to be able to pin down what's causing the new particle formation. So we don't have sulfuric acid or concentrations of organics. Um, we kind of have to get that information post hoc, hopefully from the models. In fact, we've got the fourth deployment coming up in just a couple of weeks, and we are going to be, uh, Drew Rollins from NOAA is going to be measuring SO2. So after that, we'll have a better handle on, on sulfuric acid and how much that's contributing. But from now, we're going to try and pick it out from the models. And for modeling, we're working with colleagues over at Colorado State University, Jeff Pierce, Jack Codros, Anna Hodgshire. And we're working with GeosChem as a global chemical transport model uh, with online aerosol microphysics run through the Tomas box model. <clears throat> and we can compare what we're seeing in the model to what we're seeing in ATOM. So what we did was essentially to fly a plane through the model for the exact locations and times of the ATOM flights. And then I resampled the ATOM data to the same temporal and spatial resolution as the model so that we're better comparing like with like. And I'm just showing here for simplicity a comparison with the Pacific for those number concentrations of the smallest particles, so just 3 to 12 nanometers, with ATOM on the top and the model on the bottom. And what you can see is if we focus in on the tropical upper troposphere, we are indeed seeing that pattern of intense new particle formation happening high up in the tropics. We can also compare our surface area of those larger particles. Um, and we can see again, if we focus in on the tropics, that we're generally seeing the same pattern of low surface areas high up in the tropical upper troposphere. Uh, and we can start to compare this in more detail. So what I plotted here is, as a function of altitude, the number concentration of those small particles as we measured them in the tropics over the Pacific on ATOM-1. And now I'm comparing it to the model output if we assume that all particles are formed by this simple binary nucleation mechanism, so just sulfuric acid and water taking place in making and growing the particles. That's the blue dotted line here. And what you can see is that those high altitudes, it's doing a pretty good job of capturing the ATOM measurements. It's very cold up there. Binary nucleation is a very efficient mechanism when it's very cold, um, so it makes sense that we'd start to capture the ATOM data there. However, as we get to lower altitudes, you can see that we're really underestimating the ATOM measurements from the model. And we know that binary nucleation at, at warmer temperatures is actually pretty inefficient, um, and that's why we're starting to get those much lower concentrations than what we're seeing. But we can add ammonia into the model. And ammonia acts by essentially stabilizing those small clusters of, uh, of molecules before they form the aerosol and reducing the height of that energy barrier we need to get over. That's the red line that I'm showing here. You can see it has very, really, very little effect at high altitude, A, because it's cold and binary nucleation is efficient, but also because there's just not much ammonia up there. But if we look at lower altitudes, it's really starting to boost those concentrations of the small particles. However, it's still at the lowest altitudes, an order of magnitude or even two off of what we've been seeing on ATOM. For now, the last nucleation mechanism that we're putting into GeosChem is called activation nucleation. Um, and this was is basically an empirical parameterization. So people took a lot of data of new particle formation at ground level, generally over the continents, and they found this relationship where they could relate the rate at which particles are formed, so that J I'm showing there, to the concentration of sulfuric acid. Now, this wasn't because they thought it all came from sulfuric acid, but they were using the sulfuric acid as a proxy for all low volatility species that were present, which could likely include a lot of organics. So it's an empirical equation. Um, and you can see that's in the yellow line there. You can see uh, at the top, we're really underestimating the ATOM data. And at the bottom, we're starting to overestimate it. But this kind of makes sense. This empirical parameterization was done at ground level over the continents. So extrapolating it to those really cold temperatures that we're seeing in the tropical upper troposphere is probably a bit of a stretch. Um, and if we take it down to the marine boundary layer, we kind of expect the concentrations and the actual species of organics over the marine boundary layer and over the continents to be pretty different. So it makes sense that we'd be seeing quite different things from the ATOM data. If we look at that surface area of the larger particles, uh, all of the, the different nucleation mechanisms kind of collapse onto each other as expected in the model, and we can compare them to the ATOM data in the gray. 
You can see that for now, we're tending to underestimate the surface area of these particles at lower altitudes, but kind of overestimate it once we get high up. And so that, that's something we're going to start looking into why it's occurring in the model as we move forwards. Now, another thing we can do with the modeling is just to take the box model itself. And this is what my colleague Agnieszka has been looking at. Um, so she takes the TOMAS box model from the moment at which the back trajectory exits the cloud. And then in the box model, she models how particles form and how they grow until they reach the point at which we measure them on the plane on the DC-8. <clears throat> and so she's done this first for just binary nucleation, so just considering sulfuric acid and water. Um, and for a given uh, moment in flight for one minute of data, she can create from the box model an expected size distribution, assuming the particles start nucleating when you leave the cloud and then grow until we measure them. And this size distribution is quite dependent on the amount of SO2 we put in the model. So here she's varied it between about 5 and 50 ppt, and those are the different colored lines. And um, then she compares it to the atom data that's in the background in gray. And for this specific example in tropical upper troposphere, you can see that you actually need those higher concentrations of SO2 to explain this one minute of the atom data. And we can look at this in a more continuous fashion. Um, so what I'm showing here, let's ignore the x-axis for the moment. The y-axis is different concentrations of SO2. Um, and Agnieszka has created those uh, size distributions to the box model, compared them to what we measure, um, and then colored uh, the dots there by the goodness of fit. So blue goodness of fit is a really good one, red or gray, really poor. And what you can see, again, is if you just have sulfuric acid, you're really needing those larger concentrations of SO2. However, if we now start including um, organics into the picture, <clears throat> There we go. OK, if we start including organics into the picture, it kind of changes. So now we're going to say, for simplicity, let's just have sulfuric acid and water making the particles. But as soon as they're formed, any organics that are present can start to contribute to growing them. And we look at how that changes the size distribution and how that size distribution, again, relates to what we actually saw on ATOM. And you can see for different concentrations of organics on the bottom and different concentrations of SO2 on the y-axis, we get multiple regions that have a decent fit to the ATOM data, which makes it rather complicated. However, Drew Rollins, who's going to fly with us on ATOM4, was also measuring SO2 over the tropical West Pacific back in 2017. And from his measurements and for the region that we've been doing this flight in, it looks unlikely that SO2 would really be much above 20 ppt. So we can loosely rule out the top half of that graph. And if we do so, uh, we're left with the idea that we do need some organics to really start explaining what we're seeing on the ATOM data set in terms of the size distributions high up. So I'm going to leave it there and just start to summarize uh, what we've talked about today. I'm going to go back to the first questions that we asked at the beginning of the talk. Uh, so firstly, what is it that's controlling new particle formation and growth in the present day atmosphere? And what we've seen is it's a really complex interaction between where you have low temperatures, where you have low sinks of those pre-existing large particles, and where you also have a mechanism to bring condensable vapors to these cold, clean regions of the atmosphere. Oh, yes, and from the model, we're seeing um, some hint that there may well be other low volatility species, not just sulfuric acid, involved in this nucleation and growth process, potentially organics. The second question is, how does this all affect uh, our picture of aerosols in the pre-industrial atmosphere? And that's really what we're going on to understand in our work going forwards, invest investigating the role of SO2 versus other condensable vapors in the atmosphere. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Christina. That was really, really interesting talk. Um, we have a CSM2 model here at NCAR that has a lot of um, the chemistry and microphysics. It would be really great to compare to your observations and see how that looks. Yeah, we'd be interested in that. Do we have any questions? Uh, I was just wondering if you had to do any correction for relative humidity or like the analysis that you presented, did you take into account relative humidity? Or like Sorry, the you instruments you have what? to take out the water? Oh, the water, I forgot to mention. So we actually dry the aerosol as we bring them into the instrument. We have dryers in front. 
And we always compare dry diameter of what we're measuring to dry diameter in the models. Yeah, so is the same. Yeah. Hi, Christina. Um, so would ion-induced nucleation affect any of your analysis? Um, that is a good question, and it could well do. So uh, Mary's uh, talking about ion-induced nucleation, and the idea behind this is that if you have charged particles present, they actually make it easier to form a particle. Um, and so it's going to stabilize that cluster a lot easier. It's going to reduce the height of that energy barrier. And so if these ions are involved or not, could really change where new particles are distributed in the atmosphere. Um, so colleagues at NOAA have actually done some work on this. Um, so this is, uh, Carl Freud was looking at this just from a kinetic perspective uh, back in 2012. And what he plotted out was kinetically in the atmosphere, where is it going to be easy to make particles? Where is it going to be, you can make a few but not many, and where is it just going to be really difficult and you'll need plumes of SO2 to do them? And so he's showing that in sort of this plot here. And that's if you just have neutral nucleation. That's what the picture looks like. Uh, if you include ion-induced nucleation, it really changes the picture. So that whole area that's white on the bottom graph, that's gray on the top graph, will show a lot more particles if uh, ion-induced nucleation is taking place than if it's not. Jan Kazel also published a similar paper looking at the thermodynamics of where this would actually have an effect. So we're looking at those lower altitudes in general uh, and just trying to pick out a signal of if it's just a little bit of new particle formation or if it's really a lot. Um, and so ATOM data-wise, we can start to look at that. I'm not going to give you a conclusion today. I wish I could. There's a lot of work involved. But the idea that we would look at is kind of like this. We can plot out where we're seeing strong new particle formation, uh, which I'm kind of showing on the right-hand side, where we're seeing weak new particle formation, which I'm showing on the left-hand side, and look at the differences between those. Now, please don't look at these graphs and think, oh, look, there's lots of weak new particle formation. We've got iron-induced nucleation, or we haven't. We don't know yet. There's like a ton of statistical analysis that needs to go into that. But we can, we're definitely hoping to use the ATOM data set to, to ask that exact question. Thanks, and that was not a setup. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was wondering, so the deep convection activities remove larger particles. Uh, the cloud actually also scavenges lots of the soluble gases, like ammonia, solid, like organics. So like when you have air parts that just, out, just get out of the clouds, and where do you get the condensable gases from? The um, it depends what they are. We think a lot of the SO2 up there could actually be coming from DMS. Um, and so it, it's not the SO2 itself, and it's certainly not the sulfuric acid that makes it all the way through the cloud, but it's the precursors. Um, and with the time that it takes to get through a deep convective cloud, that's still possible for a lot of stuff to survive up to these altitudes. Another related question is, uh, uh, ATOM one, we, the ATOM campaign, we do have like toga measured organics and stuff. I wonder uh, if you put those things into calculation, would that close the gaps or? Yeah, we've definitely had some interesting chats with our, our toga colleagues. We kind of look at very different sizes of, of well, yes, and it, we hope to make some relationship between the two, um, but it's, it's a little complicated just because of the size of the particles we're looking at, um, but it's something we're going to look into in the future. What is the strong particle formation at 60 degrees north on the surface there? Um, I imagine that's anthropogenic pollution. I'd have to look into the data to really identify that. But we do see um, plumes of SO2. We can relate it to things like high NOY concentrations, and a lot of those uh, high, those, those low altitude new particle formation points end up going away. Not all of them, um, but some of them do. I have a question to the um, comparison to GeoSkim. What kind of uh, aerosol model was used? Because you did all these comparisons with the size distributions. Uh, do you need a sectional model, or how, how, how many bins you need, and so on? Um, yeah, so that is a sectional model. I can't remember how many bins uh, we have in it. Just let me see if I've got it written here somewhere. Yeah, I don't have it written for time mass, but um, there's definitely a good number of size bins in there, and we can talk more offline if you want. <laughs> 
So um, in the northern hemisphere, plumes near the surface. So what's happening over the southern ocean? And you said you really didn't want to talk about it, but it was quite alluring. <laughs> no, I would love to talk about it. I think it's fascinating. I just haven't had time to do proper analysis on it. Um, Southern Ocean is really interesting because it's, it's the lowest of those sinks that we see. At, like if we calculate that full coagulation sink, super low sinks. It's also relatively low temperatures. Um, and so we kind of expect something to happen there. I don't know if we expected quite as much to happen there as we see. Um, <clears throat> but again, it could be. Uh, there could be a lot of natural processes, so organics, SO2 from DMS, potentially. But this is all a guess. We haven't looked into it yet. So we were flying over the Southern Ocean with the uh, G5, and we were seeing cloud condensation nuclei or cloud drop concentrations up to 450 per cc over large areas. And we surmise that that's probably sea spray. And I'm sitting here being a little bit envious at you because it sounds like uh, new particle formation has been, excuse my, my expression here, hijacked by the uh, coagulation community. In a sense, we have many, many other new particle formation methods like sea spray and et cetera, but we don't call that new particle formation. You don't have to ask. <laughs> well, I was wondering um, how you measured the coagulation sink. Is it a, a calculation based on the size distribution and the Microphysics. Yeah. It's it's just based on on the size distribution and then the thermodynamics, so what pressure and temperature we're at. Great data, and a great talk. Thanks. I want to go back to the precursor question. <clears throat> Pardon me. Looking at stuff over Central America in the tropics. Um, very often, we're beginning to believe that if there's a long time, that the convective influence needs to be recent. If we have a long time, if our back trajectories show that the air was lifted a long time ago, then we're not getting much new particle formation. So I worry a little bit in this scenario about lifting this air and then descending and getting the growth on descent about whether your precursors are still going to be around, what their lifetimes are, and whether on descent there's going to be enough precursor to do the condensational growth that you need. And so I'm asking is in ATOM4, is that going to get solved? Um, solved is a big word. We're going to get closer to the answer because we'll have SO2, we've got really good OH measurements, we can get sulfuric acid. Well, we can't get all of the interesting organic contributions and all the rest of it. So there will still be a missing part of that that we don't know, but we'll certainly get a lot closer to the answer. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank Christina again.